will fight our battles. And brothers and sisters, there's no difference between the battles you and I fight today against evil and against sin. Amen. God puts the promised land in front of us. Jesus Christ wants to give you power and victory over sin. The question is, is will you have faith and believe? Will you step across that line from the wilderness and go forward into Canaan, into the promised land? Will you let God do what he's always wanted to do? It's 13 minutes. That great serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Verse 10. Then I heard a, heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, excuse me, who accused them before our God, how often? Does he ever rest? What does he do? He accuses you before God day and night. Young people, where'd y'all go? Listen to this. Us old people, hopefully we, we figured this out. The devil is not your friend. What this world has to offer you that you think is so exciting and so fun is a trap. And it's a trap to get you to fall away from your belief in God so that you follow him and he'll lead you right down to hell. Yeah. Never forget that. The devil will make you do bad things. And then what does he do? He goes to God and he tattletales on you. Day and night. Night and day. And then he comes back and tries to get you to do more bad things so he can do the same thing. Over and over again. You old people here. That would be me. Everybody else. Don't forget this. Because that's what he does. Verse 11, and they... Here is another description of God's true church. How does God's people and how does God's church overcome? Verse 11, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives even to the okay. death. What this is telling you is that God's true church will be filled with a people who will not be self-centered, but they will be Christ-centered. They will not be seeking their own, but they will be seeking the betterment of their brethren and of those they meet. They will be Christ-centered and not self-centered. They will submit fully to Jesus Christ. They will know what it's like to gain the victory over this sinful flesh. How do they do that? In their own power? No. They can't. How do they do that? They understood and they will understand what Paul says when he says that I am crucified with Christ and yet I live. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. That's how God's people were overcome. And that's the kind of church you need to look at for to see if that's what they're preaching and teaching to their people. Amen. Most of the churches that I've gone to, they don't, if they ever talk about sin, they talk about it in a way that you'll never overcome it, so don't even try. Thank God for God's grace. I say, amen, thank God for God's grace, but I also want you to know, thank God for His power. Through Jesus Christ who lives in you. Because that's the power that gives you the testimony that will overcome. Amen? Amen. Amen? They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Verse 12, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. you got to love that. What does the next thing say? <laughs> Woe to who? The inhabitants of the earth. Rejoice, heavens. Why? Because Lucifer is no longer there. But woe to you, earth. Why? Because this is where he's been kicked out to. Him and all his followers. For the devil has come down to you having great wrath. Why, Ray? Because he knoweth that his time, that 
12. Because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. So the devil is upset because he knows he has a short time. Verse 13. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Who's the woman? The church. Right? So the devil went after the church. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle. Now again, like I told you, not in cons consecutive order, but chronological order. There you, go. you see, it's going back and forth, back and forth. Now the attention is back on this woman, and it's going to give you another time date. And you're going to find that this time date is the same time date as the 1260 days. Verse 14, but the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness. Remember, we always read that the woman fled into the wilderness for 1260 days, all right? So here, verse 14 says, the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for what? A time, times, and half a time. A time is a year. Times would be two years. So that's a total of what? Three. Three years. What's a half a time? Half a, half a year. Three and a half years, right? Now, how many of you guys have a calculator on your phone? In the Bible, in the book of Genesis, you find out how long the ark was um, on the water, dry land, from the time it starts to the time it ends. What you find out is that a month in the Bible is a period of 30 days, right? 30 days. 30 days times three and a half years will come out to something. Okay. And it will come out to 1260. Right? Yep. If you go 42 months, 42 times 30 also comes out to what? And in a couple chapters over, it's going to give you the same time proxy for 42 months. Okay? So, a day for a year, you're talking about a 1260 year time frame. Now, this chapter also coincides with the chapter that Ray uh, preached about last week and a couple of weeks before that, Revelation chapter 14. It also coincides with the chapter that speaks about the beast, the image of the beast, and the same time period. So, again, these aren't separate uh, stories. These aren't separate um, events in time. These are talking about the same thing from different angles, from different views. You understand that? So this chapter, chapter 12, is focusing on the church. The other chapters focus on the beast. The other chapters will have a whole other focus. But let's look here because I only got a short period of time left. I'm going to backtrack here a little bit. This dragon who has seven heads and ten horns. Let me find the scripture verse. Turn to Revelation chapter 17, it's just a couple of chapters forward. <coughs> Ray preached out of this last week as well. Revelation 17, let's look at verses 9 through 14. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. There were also seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, and the other has yet to come. And when he comes, he must continue for a short time. Now, verse 11 talks about what? The beast, right? The beast that was is not, and himself also the eighth, and of the seventh, and is going into perdition. What I'm talking to you today, all these things coincide together. They're not separate events. Do you understand that? You need to see this, and I'm going to show this to you. Hopefully, I can bring this all together. 
I brought you to this text to show you that this dragon with the seven heads, ten crowns upon his heads, speaks of human governments and human power. And this is why I told you that this dragon not only represents Lucifer, but it also represents his kingdom here on this earth and all those governments that he controls. Do you know what the seven major kingdoms of this earth have been? I wrote it down. The first one, what do you think? Where did the children of Israel come out of? Egypt. So the first world power would be Egypt, right? After that would be Assyria. Then the next one we all know is Babylon. Who comes after Babylon? Medo-Persia. Medo Who comes after Medo-Persia? Greece. Greece. Who comes after Greece? Rome. Now think about Rome. And I'm going to read you again chapter 17 and how accurate the scriptures are and why the historical view of interpretation is the best. Amen. Verse 8, the beast you saw was and is not. No, uh, hold on. That's not it. Verse 10, there are seven kings... Five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. Okay, now, that last one. When John wrote the book of Revelation, who was the world power back then? Rome. Rome. And who was, who was the king of Rome? What was his name? Emperors. Emperors and Caesars, right? This is how accurate this is, because Rome had two phases. Go to your encyclopedias, Google this, because you'll find this. We used to just tell the people, go get the World Book Encyclopedia, and you can find all this information out. Nobody uses those anymore, so now you tell them, Google it. Google this. Know your history, because history will back up what we're teaching and what we're saying here. So Rome had two phases. You had the pagan phase, which were controlled by emperors and Caesars? Why did the Christians have problems with the Caesars? And why did the Caesars have problems with the Christians? Caesars demanded worship. What kind of worship? Personal worship. Worship that they were gods. Right? And the Christians said, we can't do this. The Jews also said, we can't do this. There's one God. And we will worship Him. What you find is that as these tribes around Rome, guys, are you familiar with the vision found in the book of Daniel, of the statue? Yes. Okay. From Daniel's day, it gives you the world powers. Okay? All the way down to the feet. How many toes are on that statue? Ten. Ten. And those toes are a mixture of what? Iron, Iron and clay. Iron. What do those toes represent? Kingdoms? Do you know what kingdoms? Europe. Okay. Europe. That's good. So listen. So in John's day, when Rome still had its power under the pagan aspect, you started to have the birth of these tribes. And these tribes were not friendly to Rome. And in the end, Rome had become so weak because of its own filth and its own immorality. Immorality, thank you. Look at this country. Look at Rome. Look at this country. Look at the history of the two. And they go parallel. But anyway, it's another story. Rome had become so weak from the inside that when these barbarian tribes started to attack them, what happened to them? Rome started to fall. Rome started to fall, and it went from Caesar and emperor-controlled uh, government to what kind of government? Who did they look to? Up to that point, the church of God was persecuted by Rome. But there came a point in history where Rome actually accepted Christianity and accepted the church. Do you know what year that was? 
Say that loud. Somebody had it right. No, that's the end. The beginning. When they accepted it, 538. 38. If you go from this 1260 year period, right? 1260 days, time, time, half, time, time, 42 months, 1260 years. If it starts at 538, you go 1260 years, what do you come to? 1798. You know what happened in 1798? Huh? Yeah, don't, don't say that yet. Let's get through this history first. Uh, I've got over five minutes. If you give me five more minutes, we'll make this, uh, we'll, we'll make this part two after, after this. I, I'll give you this, we'll end with this. So, you have the Christian church. And they suffered great persecution under the emperors and the Caesars. Rome itself started to fall. God's people started to bring in strange doctrine even before 538. So you started having groups that believe this and groups that believe that. By the time 538 took place, you had a falling away from scriptural truth. You had the church who had apostatized and stepped away from Jesus Christ. And they started to incorporate the religion of man. And they exalted the customs of men and the teachings of men and the traditions of men over the truth of the Word of God. And in that you had this birth of what the Bible says is this son of perdition, this man of sin. Daniel saw him in vision way, way back in the day as the little horn power who had a mouth to speak blasphemies and great words against the Most High God. And that this little horn power would wear out the saints of the Most High God. And it would have control and trample underfoot the sanctuary of God for a specific time period. You know what that time period was in Daniel? 1260 years. What that's talking about there, what this is talking about in Revelation, is the same event. This falling away, this rise of the man of sin, God's true people having to go underground, hiding in the wilderness for this time period. Again, a waymark of God's true church. They would not be an open organization during this time. All the way up to 1798. Our closing hymn this morning is hymn number 625. <laughs>
bow our heads. Heavenly Father, as we close this service, Lord, pray that the people's appetites would have been wet with what we've heard today. That they'll be able to see the clarity of your word and how accurate you are in describing the future. That you have showed us clearly what has taken place in the past, but you also tell us what's going to happen in our day and on all the way to the coming of Jesus Christ. Father, there is so much deception and deceit out there in this world. What we want to know is your truth. We want to be able to see it and see it clearly. And Father, I thank you that you have given us your word that if we study, if we become true students of the Bible, not ashamed, but knowing how to divide this word rightly, Father, I pray that we'll be able to share this with those that we meet, that the gospel will be preached and that Jesus can come. Father, this is my prayer. This is what I ask. That you bless all those who are here. That you give them wisdom, insight, and that you use us for your glory. For this we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.